So hello everyone. Welcome at our today's online event on uh, support uh, on support instruments for renewables development uh, in Germany in Ukraine. So today here with us uh, we have um, Dr. Christian Bradl from the the most uh, prominent uh, German think tank organization Agora Energiewende. Uh, this organization is uh, doing a lot of research in the sector of energy transition and is actively involved in this process in Germany. Also to today with us we have representatives of uh, the Clean Energy Lab NGO who are uh, co-hosting this event and here with us are Alina Sviderska and um, uh, Oleksiy Mikhailenko. So uh, to provide you with a bit of background why we have uh, ideated this uh, online seminar. For many of you who are following the sector of renewables in Ukraine, uh, you can remind easily when the uh, discussion on retroactive changes for renewables just has uh, started in Ukraine, there were a lot of information on different support schemes, especially in other countries and how support mechanisms for future renewables development work there. And uh, some of uh, those examples were given uh, with, uh, with Germany case. And uh, sometimes it happened that uh, due to the lack of understanding on how to compare different uh, support schemes and uh, on what was the evolution of renewable support in Germany, uh, the cases of manipulation with such comparison data and cases of other countries uh, were quite often in the public discourse on renewables in Ukraine. That is why we decided to conduct such event. Uh, so uh, now we will ask uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Christian Radl, to uh, tell us about the evolution of uh, renewable support mechanisms in Germany, when and how they were adjusted and to which results uh, for renewable development, first of all, these instruments uh, allowed in uh, Germany and what uh, in Germany they have now uh, in electricity production mix. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Christian, please, we welcome you. Uh, many thanks, Oksana, and a very good afternoon or early evening um, to all of you. It's a pleasure for me uh, to, to give this input, and I'm also very much looking forward then to the discussion, uh, to all your comments, questions, um, uh, and, and, and issues. So I've prepared some slides. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Just a second. Okay, I hope this is working. Um, if you can see the presentation, Oksana, is everything fine? Yes, everything is fine. Thank Full you. Then, mode. Great. Um, so, um, Indeed, as Oksana said, the focus uh, of, of, of my input will be on developments with respect to the power sector uh, in Germany and specifically the uh, dimension of renewables um, and, and the support instruments. I mean, as you know, the energy transition is of a course product not only concerns power. So we at our Agora uh, Energiewende or Ag Agora Energy Transition would be the English name um, focus quite a lot in our work on, on power, but we also deal with buildings uh, and in, uh, industry um, and the consequences of the energy transition for, for those two sectors. And then we have a sister organization called Agora Mobility, which obviously uh, deals with the transport sector. Um, but let's just jump into the uh, uh, topic just to give you a, a quick um, uh, overview on where do we stand in the German power system with respect to the tr transition. The overall aim, of course, is to switch from a historically uh, coal and nuclear based system to a fully uh, renewables and energy efficiency based system. And uh, as of end of 2019, uh, the German power mix consisted of 40% uh, renewables electricity 
and then 60% uh, conventionals, uh, some 25% lignite and hard coal, as you can see in this slide, 12% nuclear, and also roughly 13% uh, gas, natural gas based electricity. What I find important in this graph is within um, um, a few years, uh, renewables have actually become the biggest uh, uh, pillar in the German power system and they generate uh, uh, as much as coal, uh, hard coal and lignite and nuclear together. Also quite interesting within renewables and I will talk uh, about that in more detail, uh, within renewables it's essentially two technologies. Uh, who provide more than two thirds of the electricity coming from renewables. That's wind, mainly onshore wind, but uh, recently also offshore wind is kicking off in Germany and photovoltaics. And then we have some biomass and hydro in the system, but as you will see, um, um, that has essentially remained rather stable over the last uh, years. Now, when we look into the, um, let's say historical evolution. Um, one of the starting points was indeed in the energy transition to phase out nuclear and replace it with renewables. And then only later on, uh, um, the next phase was taken to also engage in uh, phasing out coal electricity. And when uh, nuclear became, let's say, uh, slowly to be phased out and renewables to be phased in, there was always the, let's say, the, the claim that renewables cannot replace nuclear. But as you can see in this graph, uh, you have uh, the, the green area, which is the total annual production of renewables in the German electricity system. The growth in renewables, uh, let's say, outpaced the uh, decrease in the gray part, which is the, the nuclear generation, the German system. So the total sum of CO2 free generation has uh, quite significantly increased in Germany over the last years. We've seen that only recently, so that's the brown part for lignite and the black part for hard coal, that uh, the, the coal-based uh, generation has decreased. I will come back to the reason uh, for that in a minute. It's mainly uh, the European emissions trading scheme, which deteriorates the economics of coal-fired generation, opposed to uh, mainly gas-fired generation, which is this sort of blue bar or, or, or blue area here. This is gas fire generation. You can see that this is slowly, yeah, sort of increasing in Germany. But the, the biggest, let's say, dynamic comes indeed from the green part, from the renewables. Now, um, one more word on the conventional side before I, I, I switch to, to renewables again. Um, uh, in the past, uh, typically, uh, lignite was in terms of the generation cost the, the cheapest uh, conventional source in the German system followed by hard coal and then followed by natural gas. But indeed with the introduction of the European emissions trading scheme, uh, which um, puts a surcharge, so to speak, on the cost of fossil generators, the picture slowly started to change. And essentially, uh, for now a bit more than two years, uh, we see that coal is getting more, especially hard coal is getting more expensive than uh, gas fire generation. Now also uh, lignite is more expensive uh, than gas fire generation. And then I think it's really a game changer uh, when we talk about the, the future of the fossil fuel sector in, in Europe and its role in, in, in power generation. Um, there is more detail on the slide, but I understand that the slides will be shared with you. So you can you can look it up and you can always get back to me with questions, but I, I really want to focus now on the main, let's say, uh, headline messages in, in, my, in my input. Um, so renewables next to energy efficiency are the main pillars of the energy transition. I would say not only in Germany, 
but um, 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 uh, more on a global uh, scale increasingly. And I, I've shown you that currently we have some 40% of renewables in the electricity mix of the German system. The official target now for 2030 is to get to a 65% share of renewables in uh, gross electricity consumption and also in the uh, government plans and targets you see that it's mainly uh, this uh, blue and yellow parts uh, so again onshore wind offshore wind and PV uh, who should uh, uh, stem most of this increase here you can see the historic evolution of the generation from hydro in this light blue and from biomass in green. And you see that also in the government plans, this remains stable. Why biomass is essentially more expensive than wind and PV generated electricity. And uh, for hydro, there is of course, I mean, there are resource constraints uh, and essentially in Germany, there's not much more to be gained or, or much more sites to be developed. So it's really, when we talk about the energy transition, the power sector, it's really um, uh, deploying wind and PV. Now, to get this growth going, of course, there was uh, quite some uh, government support and deployment policies needed. This is the uh, so-called renewables uh, energy law. Uh, EEG is the, it's just a German uh, abbreviation for that law. So you may have come across that uh, term. And uh, the, the first, let's say big EEG, the first renewable support act was uh, implemented in Germany in the year 2000. And as you can see on this graph, it was revised several times. You can say that maybe every three years or so, there's a revision of the renewable support law um, being implemented. Um, um, and that um, should actually, let's say, um, uh, mirror what's going on with respect to the technology development. Yeah, when we started in the year 2000, it was not clear that wind and PV would so clearly win the cost race. So all the technologies were put on an equal footing, but then it became clear that the cost, the technology cost decreased quite strongly, especially for PV. So in the revisions, there was always uh, a bigger role for PV and then, and then wind in turn. And then also as the, the share of uh, renewables um, uh, has grown quite steadily, of course, their role in the power system changes. Yeah, they also have to become more, let's say, active participants of say grid services of balancing energy. Uh, and for that, the support instrument was changed over the time. In the first years, it was mainly the feed-in tariff, which was granted for 20 years. Uh, and then it was adjusted to a sliding feed-in premium system uh, starting as of 2012. So after 12 years of feed-in tariffs, which were paid for 20 years, we Germany uh, switched to a feed-in premium system. And then in 2017, uh, there was a switch from determining this support level through administration, uh, the feed-in premium level, to a system where it's uh, determined through a competitive auction. So rather recently, only these auctions have been implemented in Germany, but let's say for the renewables invested, still this feed-in premium, which is the main uh, um, um, instrument. Okay, um, the flip side of that is of course that someone has to pay for that, those, uh, those feed-in tariffs and feed-in premiums. And the German system is as such that it's mainly household consumers who are paying for that. So indeed next to Denmark, Germany has the highest household electricity rates uh, in the European Union. It's around 30 euro cents per kilowatt hour for households and most of the discussion, I don't want to go into the details, but there was a discussion on cost increases, but it stemmed or it, it focused mainly on this greenish part, uh, which is the EG surcharge. So uh, the uh, surcharge for renewables, which on the other hand is let's say then paid to renewables operators. And this has increased, let's say 
over 10 years from one cent per kilowatt hour to more than six cent per kilowatt hours. So quite an increase. Uh, the good news is it's now stabilizing. Uh, so we have, let's say, I would say reached the cost maximum. Uh, of course, it's always uh, the technology gets cheaper. So get the feed-in tariffs and the feed-in premiums, but since they are paid for 20 years, you know, you, you carry, um, uh, um, so to speak, some, 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 some cost burden for, for, for some years into the future. Um, the flip side of that is that industry is actually benefiting from that because industry is to a large extent exempted from those tariffs. So a typical industry uh, pays half the price than the, for households and specifically for energy intensive industry where energy costs do play a role. I would say, I would dare to say for many industries, the uh, energy costs are not a main determinant of the overall economic performance, but for energy intensive industries, uh, steel, cement, aluminum, etc., some certain chemical industries, they are. And there Germany is really very actively uh, pursuing exemption policies, not only for the renewable surcharge, but also for grid tariffs. And that has the result that German energy intensive industry pays amongst the lowest electricity prices uh, throughout Europe. So there is no, let's say it's not necessarily a huge conflict to have a competitive industrial base and at the same time uh, uh, ramp up renewables. Um, this is just uh, to, to reinforce what I've said, um, that also for household consumers, let's say the, the, the highest share of costs has been paid. Uh, you see here on the right hand side, the evolution of uh, the renewable surcharge and the expected wholesale price payments. So the main, so to speak, energy components of the electricity bill. And you see that this is expected to really in peak this and next year and then uh, to, to start falling. So from then on also household consumers can really benefit uh, from, from renewables because what are renewables doing on the wholesale market, they lower the wholesale market price because they have zero marginal cost and as such um, for any uh, consumer who can directly buy electricity from the wholesale market like large industry, like energy intensive industry does, um, um, can, can benefit from this price dampening effect of, of renewables. A uh, few words on auctions as this is now the main instrument um, uh, for determining the support level. Uh, there is, I think, quite positive development with respect to large scale PV. Um, uh, where prices has, have dropped quite significantly in these auctions, starting from about 75 euros per megawatt hour, reaching now around uh, 45 to 50 euros per megawatt hour. And this is, let's say, the total remuneration. And because it's a sliding feed-in premium system, that means that part of this, say, 50 euros per megawatt hour come from the wholesale market, yeah? Uh, so it's directly marketed on the electricity exchange. If you have, let's say, a wholesale price level of 25 euros, then the renewables operator directly earns that from the market. And for the rest, he or she gets the sliding premium paid by the grid operator, who is again financed mainly from households, as we've seen. Uh, there is a slightly different picture for onshore wind, where the, the prices have remained rather flat uh, on a somewhat higher end around 60 euros per megawatt hour so here the premium payment is is higher um, to compensate for the higher required uh, remuneration for investors now why is this um, so to speak higher than pv that's mainly an issue in germany with respect to available sites uh, the planning and the permitting for onshore wind takes quite some term, time in Germany. So there are not enough projects entering the auction. Uh, and the auction can only work if you have competition, if there is enough, if there is, let's say, more bidders who want to get their projects financed than what is uh, auctioned off in terms of volume. Um, and we don't have any competition, so to speak, in the German wind auctions. That's why the prices are higher. So 
policymakers are really struggling to to um, accelerate all the planning and permitting, uh, to uh, incre decrease the risks for project developers, such that there is enough projects entering the auctions. When once that is there, uh, then uh, we should see also decreasing prices in the wind auctions. Now, nonetheless, the total picture is that if we compare the level as cost of electricity, so the say full cost of new technologies uh, if you um, even uh, um, compare on the conservative side so very low prices for co2 then uh, doesn't matter whether you build a wind plant or a pv plant or a gas plant it costs the same but if you look uh, into the future and when we look into the european union system where um, uh, it, uh, CO2 prices are increasing uh, in the last years, then it's very clear that uh, wind and PV are the most competitive options for new built uh, electricity generation. Uh, now that brings about challenges because wind and PV, they depend on, let's say, the wind conditions, uh, whether the sun is shining or not. So it's more, let's say, variable form of generation and that means we need a total new paradigm for managing our power systems and that is flexibility we don't need base load capacity anymore i don't know big plants which run 24 7 we need plants uh, we need flexibility also on the demand side which matches or mirrors let's say the generation from from wind and pv um, and that's a very new paradigm. That means we need to adjust our market design and also our, let's say, regulatory incentives for, for building flexibility. Uh, and this can be on the, on the generation side, like, I don't know, gas turbines or flexible biomass or hydro storage plants. But it also um, means we need to build more grids to um, uh, to interconnect countries better. I will talk about that in a bit more detail, but also demand side can be more flexible. And we see it on the German power market that energy intensive industries actively trading on the market, trying to be more flexible in terms of production uh, to benefit from periods when there's a lot of wind and PV, when power prices are very low can even get negative. So you get money if you consume electricity, which might sound a bit surprising at first instance. Um, um, so there are many, many flexibility providers, but we need of course the, the correct uh, uh, market design and regulation to get those flexible uh, um, options in, in the market. Here, this is just to, to highlight the, the value of integration and, and, and thinking beyond borders in terms of managing power systems. So on, at the very end, you see the output of a single wind plant. Um, actually, that's a case study from Bavaria. Uh, you see that this wind plant over a month is changing its production from essentially zero to almost full installed capacity. But when we aggregate all wind generation throughout countries and throughout Europe, we end up with a, with a much smoother generation. So this is this pinkish line at the end, this whole um, uh, wind generation aggregated over the month of May in Europe. And essentially what we see that this flexibility challenge, the, the hourly variation in wind generation is essentially only half uh, if we consider it from a European perspective compared to the national perspective. So there is a lot of efficiency to be gained if countries are better connected uh, and then everyone can benefit, let's say, from, um, from cheap uh, wind power. Now there's also an economic challenge. I've mentioned that the technology costs of renewables, especially PV, but also wind have decreased, but the cost structure is different. Uh, whereas fossil fuel plants are mainly characterized by uh, a high share of variable operating cost and low fixed cost and investment cost, it's just vice versa when we talk about wind and PV, because the wind, shine, uh, the wind blows for free and the sun shines for free, so hardly any operational costs, but the investment cost dominates. And it also means um, that risks are then the key determinant of the total cost of new renewables 
because investors will all, only engage in building those plants when they are sure that they earn back their investment costs. Um, and um, to highlight that, there was an interesting study by uh, IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, um, some years back, where they compared the cost competitive potential for uh, various renewables in Southeast Europe. And as a nutshell, or uh, um, as a main message, you can say that the cost competitive potential varies by a factor of 10 if there is a low risk environment or whether there is a high risk environment. So really it's now getting uh, a low cost energy transition is not a matter of technology anymore. It's really a matter of good regulation and good market design structures that can minimize the risk of investors. And as a case study, we were working last year together with the financial experts from New Climate Institute on a study to showcase the key role of investor risks. Um, as you know, Germany is considered as a low risk country for investors. It has a long tradition for renewable support policies. So the cost of capital uh, quite low amongst the lowest in the European Union. Uh, but when we compare this, for example, like an accession country, uh, Serbia from the Western Balkans, we see that the cost of equity and the cost of debt are three times as high as in Germany. That also means that the same wind onshore plant with the same wind conditions almost costs twice as much than in Germany, which is totally inefficient, of course, Yeah, if you think from maximizing renewables deployment. Uh, and then it's really boils down to few flaws in the market design, uh, in the support um, uh, law, in, in the laws governing the grid access and the planning and the permitting, which uh, we derived from structured interviews with, with banks, with investors, um, and that we get then this uh, uh, threefold increase in cost of equ equity and cost of risk. The good news is with only rather few and limited adjustments in the regulation, you can already lower again these risks. Um, and what does it mean? I'm skipping that. Um, uh, this is more for background information, but what does it mean with, let's say, four rather limited uh, uh, um, uh, changes in the regulation governing renewables investment in Serbia, we could lower the cost of wind projects uh, in Serbia by 20%. And that's of course extremely efficient. Um, it boils down to really having uh, um, long-term renewables remuneration schemes in place, which are considered as reliable and robust uh, to allow to engage in uh, corporate PPAs, to have a good market design structure, to have balancing rules, which do not disadvantage uh, wind generators, for example, but also to have some, let's say, support from the EU framework, which can back domestic support payments um, with, with such rather, let's still call it limited uh, um, changes. We, we can really get, we can really make a huge step forward in, in lowering the cost of renewables and as such uh, moving forward with the transition. So in the end, uh, that's almost my conclusion. I would say the main challenge now, the technology cost um, is not the, the biggest issue anymore. It's about getting good robust frameworks and smart financing instruments to lower the risk of renewables investors uh, and as such uh, uh, um, get uh, um, uh, further progress in the energy transition. What is the EU's plan? You have, I'm for sure, heard about this new strategy of the European Commission and the whole European Union, actually, the so-called EU Green Deal, uh, which should um, um, put the EU on a road to uh, being uh, in alignment with the Paris Agreement obligations with respect to specifically reaching climate neutrality, so net zero emissions by 2050. And only last week, the European Commission announced its plan to increase the EU's climate ambition for 2030, which is currently 40% emission reduction compared to 1990, to at least 55%. Uh, that will mean uh, that by 2030, we would have 
some 65% of renewables in the EU's electricity mix, so very similar to the current target of Germany. And to reach that, there are of course several challenges I'm, I mentioned quickly te technical ones like the flexibility challenge, but also mainly financial and regulatory challenges. And uh, so next year we can really expect quite a lot from the European Commission to propose new rules on power market design, on renewable support policies. Um, uh, also, of course, uh, on the aspect of just transition, which I have not touched upon because phasing in renewables means essentially phasing out something else. And for the EU, that mainly means phasing out coal. Um, and as you know, in some regions, especially um, uh, in, in the Eastern part of the uh, EU, uh, that's a very uh, important uh, economic factor. So there should also be quite some support to ensure that this transition is, let's say, socially just. Uh, that it offers perspectives for as many people as possible, um, that it maximizes uh, energy security, and that in a nutshell, in the end, minimizes the cost of, of the energy system. Okay, I think I stop here uh, and um, yeah, look very much forward to, to all your comments and questions then uh, a bit later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, for the very comprehensive, uh, let's say, amazing presentation. And thank you for the optimistic and about the more climate ambitious uh, targets uh, in EU that give us hope for the uh, better climate future for all of us. And for us, as for uh, Heinrich Bottle Foundation, for sure, climate change is one of the driving forces why we are speaking about renewables, first of all. And when we speak about renewables, for us, it is very important that the discourse around this topic is built on the truthful, trusted information that can be critically revised and that this information can be checked, that uh, we have open data and so on. And for example, from your presentation, we already heard some uh, breaks of those manipulations that were uh, raised in Ukrainian discourse uh, when we talked about the retroactive changes for renewables, like that in Ukraine we have the highest prices among all EU countries for electricity. Now we see that even if in Germany this is 30 euro cents per kilowatt, then this is already not true for Ukraine. And uh, who is paying for renewables is uh, next a big difference between the Ukrainian system and Germany system. Here uh, we have households who are not included in the uh, paying for, for renewables um, and in Germany it is absolutely vice versa. So there are so many differences and uh, we need to know uh, at least most of them to compare properly support systems in Ukraine and in Germany. And now I'm inviting Alina Sviderska to tell more about these differences in our support schemes in our countries for us to see what we need to pay attention for when we next time think about comparing support schemes in our countries. Yeah, thank you so much, Oksana, for passing the word. And thank you so much, Christian, for the uh, wonderful presentation. Of course, all of us have tons of questions and um, it was very, very insightful. Uh, continuing and complementing to what um, Oksana has already shared, I think I will take up to five minutes. Uh, so uh, basically the uh, key thing of, of why we are even having this discussion on top of what um, Oksana has already mentioned is that we are always uh, keen to have the uh, right information, most transparent and uh, um, economic data rather than uh, political statements, is that in, in Ukraine during the last year we had this big discussion about the green energy, feed-in tariff reduction, because the country is obviously in this energy transition mode. And uh, Germany was always put in as an example of uh, how it works better in Europe and that similar should be done in Ukraine. And very often uh, the uh, prices for renewable energy in Germany were compared to the highest in Europe feed-in tariff. 
And uh, while this was done, it was never uh, actually said how it works in Germany, how it works in Ukraine. And uh, in our view, and in my view, uh, it, it is completely incorrect to compare the current uh, uh, prices for renewable energy in Germany and uh, the feed-in tariff which we have in Ukraine. And uh, for the basic uh, uh, reasons, because you, we, we know that in Germany, the uh, support mechanism for green, green energy started in 1991. Then there were certain transitions, which Christ, Christian already mentioned in Ukraine that started uh, in 2009 quite unsuccessfully. Then there was also a number of transitions, but it was def definitely later than in Germany. Uh, then in terms of the uh, term of the support in Germany, that was 20 years. In Ukraine, that is uh, 10 years, depending on when the project is commissioned, because the end date of the support is connected to the uh, 2030. Then there, there is already uh, also a number of uh, uh, support mechanisms from the governmental side. Like in Germany, the grid connection might be uh, definitely easier than in Ukraine. Uh, in Ukraine, the grid connection might take up to 40% of the project cost, which definitely increases the uh, LCOE of the project uh, and makes it more expensive. Uh, then the way the FAT is paid is also very different. Uh, that uh, in Germany, the households mostly uh, cover this uh, burden uh, of the green energy, while in Ukraine, that is business. So in Ukraine, we have absolutely everything vice versa. In Ukraine, business have higher prices for electricity and uh, households pay twice less, while in Germany it's uh, very different. Uh, speaking about the auctions, which uh, was a hot topic in, in Ukraine since probably last year or even last two years, uh, it, they are still, uh, were not launched, they were supposed to launch uh, this um, April, but uh, they didn't because of this uh, feeding tariff issue. Um, and in Germany, the auctions work from 2014 to 2017, relatively uh, new, but uh, still it, it, Germany has experience in that. And uh, of course, uh, Germany having this long history of uh, green energy development and transition ended up with the auction price of like four or five euro cents uh, for, for uh, solar uh, projects. In Ukraine, uh, there were hopes and desires to have the same price already. And uh, I, I really like the, the, the phrase which you said, Christian, is that the low prices is not actually so much about technology, but about the good regulations, which Ukraine didn't actually mention, to, uh, manage to have. Uh, and this was uh, a list of different things like this new electricity market, which doesn't work, and uh, uh, the steps which the government made in, in, in terms of these retroactive changes. Uh, so while we're talking about the potential auctions, okay, next year, and then the government is hoping for a cheaper price, then how can we talk about that if uh, the market is not working, if their uh, retroactive change already happened, meaning that the country risks are increasing and the cost of capital will also probably even increase more. Um, so uh, all these sorts of... Um, Criterias and uh, uh, points should have should should be taken into account while we're talking about the price of the energy, and this is the discussion which we rarely have in Ukraine, and uh, that's why we're having discussion here, and hopefully we'll have more questions uh, further on and comments. Uh, it's just very important that we always bear in mind that if we're comparing something, we have to understand what we are comparing and what are the components of uh, each regime, each uh, support scheme, each electricity market, all of them are very different. Yeah, so this is the brief summary of uh, previous presentation on what is happening in Ukraine right now. Thank you so much, Alina. And uh, now at this moment, we are going to open the questions and answer session. So please, if you have any questions, you can raise the raise your hand instrument in Zoom. So take your mouse, click on your name, and then raise your hand. Or uh, also you can type your name, uh, you can type your question in uh, chat, but please write the name of uh, the person whom you are addressing the question. So if you have any questions to Christian, Alina, or you will see in the uh, group of participants, people whom you would like to engage to the discussion, or you have some comments uh, to say, please, uh, don't hesitate to do so. Uh, 
uh, and uh, to open the questions and answers uh, session while you are thinking about your questions, I would like to start with few of, uh, of those questions that you uh, mentioned uh, in the registration form, where was the option to leave your question to uh, panelists. And uh, the, one of the questions was about the uh, state budget support to renewables, and it was formulated as uh, uh, for how many years in future we still should have uh, state budget support, meaning that we are currently supporting renewables from, from the state budget. So mostly I would address this question to you, Alina, as for Ukrainian representative knowing what is happening now or if any one of, uh, of participants would like to add uh, furthermore on that, just please uh, do so. So, Alina? Yeah, thanks so much for the question. That's actually one of my favorite myths about green energy that is being supported from the budget. Um, and actually, until uh, this August, there was zero support from the budget. Uh, so it's important to understand where the money go uh, to cover the feed-in tariff, uh, which is for the green energy project and this comes not from the budget it's included in the end bill of the consumers uh, the same thing is in germany the same thing is in ukraine the, the, the difference is that in germany is being paid by households and in ukraine is being paid by business so uh, it's to be more uh, specific the green tariff is paid from the small part of the end bill uh, of the business which takes approximately like 10 percent it's called the transmission system operated tariff uh, tariff and 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 that's how it's done but in uh, uh, August uh, or actually in July there was a uh, adopted legislation which uh, retroactively reduced fit-in tariffs and one of the uh, last minute amendment was that 20% um, of the compensation for the fit-in tariff could go from the state budget and uh, that was unexpected for uh, many players but okay maybe this could be the source and obviously right now the government does not have money from the budget to cover uh these expenses but only in august uh this innovation came into force and we'll see how it works probably it will not work even we'll see thank you lina uh, so for the moment we have not had in ukraine any state budget spent for uh, renewables uh, comparing to other energy sectors which are heavily subsidized uh, by the state budget and the one more question was about how to compare actually feed and tariff in ukraine and uh, the support scheme in germany so if we say about feed and tariff in ukraine and as you just mentioned there were some uh, mentionings of the highest feed-in tariff uh, in uh, Europe, meaning that renewables receive uh, the biggest amount of money. Uh, but when we compare it with Germany, could we compare just the feed number with feed-in premium number? So uh, might be Alina, you will start, and uh, Christian or Alex, if any of you would like to continue, just please. I understand that the answer to this question might be really long because I mean, uh, once again, oh, one we, we yeah, have time. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I think that the important thing is that we we cannot just compare the numbers. For example, fifteen euro cents and and five euro cents. This is completely in, incorrect. Uh, what we always have to bear in mind is this LCOE, the levelized cost, cost of electricity. I think that uh, both Christian and, and Alex Michalenka can, can talk more about that. But that basically means the, the cost of building the project. Uh, in Ukraine, it's higher than in Europe for many reasons, because the cost of capital is higher, uh, because, I mean, because of tons of other reasons. Uh, so every time we compare these numbers we have to bear in mind the actual cost of the project i will give uh, maybe floor to christian and alex who can actually elaborate more on, on this in more details so maybe very quickly on uh, maybe i focus on on germany and now with this uh, switch from feeding tariffs to feeding premium so on on the um in principle um it doesn't matter much, so to speak. Yeah, if you have, I don't know, a 50 euros per megawatt hour feed-in tariff, then uh, this amount is direct 
directly uh, transferred to the renewables operator uh, uh, who, who then sells electricity uh, to the TSO essentially. But for the feed-in premium, you basically um, um, have then suddenly more responsibility on the shoulders of the renewables generator because then he or she becomes an active participate in the market and is essentially balancing responsible. Um, now, uh, in the old system, before the auctions, it, to still I stick to the number 50, there was a remuneration uh, uh, foreseen in the regulation of 50 euros per megawatt hours, let's say to, to a PV operator. Uh, and that means with balancing ob uh, obligation and direct marketing obligation, then this electricity is sold on the market and maybe on the electricity exchange, the operator gets 25 euros per megawatt hour if the power price is 25. And then the TSO tops this up at, by 25 which in turn indeed, uh, as Alina also mentioned, is then paid by the households mainly uh, or financed through household payments. Now in the auction system, it's just the same that the operator enters the auction with a required remuneration to cover the total cost uh, uh, and then of course a rate of return on the project. And let's stick again to the example, again, 50. Uh, and if it's then the, the, the clearing price in the auction, then the operator still operates on the market, is balancing responsible sales electricity in the market, say earns now the price has risen, uh, has risen to 30 euro, he or she earns 30 euros per megawatt hour from the market and gets 25, uh, 20, sorry, to match the total required 50 as determined in the auction again through uh, the TSO and the TSO uh, uh, gets the money uh, through the electricity bills from, from the households. That's how I would explain it ex actually. Thank you so much for the such open answer. Uh, if uh, we can uh, proceed to next questions, we have some of uh, them in chat. So to continue with you, Christian, uh, the question is about the biomass. So uh, could you please estimate the potential of electricity from biomass in Germany? And what significant institutional or organizational barriers have you already experienced, as I understand, for biomass? And what lessons might uh, Ukraine learn from these circumstances? Sorry, I needed to unmute myself. Sorry. Yeah, many thanks for the question. Um, I would say uh, the, uh, the further uh, growth potential for biomass in the German power system is very limited. Currently, biomass generates some 8% uh, of the um, um, renewable electricity in Germany. That's also, so to speak, the historic, um, I mean, uh, the, the, the terawatt hour equivalent would be the historic constant contribution from biomass. And it's simply not uh, possible to increase this. It's, first of all, from an economic perspective, it's much more expensive then wind and PV, uh, and we have land use uh, and resource constraints, you know, energy versus food, uh, uh, for example. Um, so there are also quite some serious sustainability concerns with respect to biomass. So also in the, the recent revisions of the uh, Renewable Support Act in Germany, it was very clear that there were very, very low shares of the budget available uh, foreseen or tagged for new biomass projects. Um, uh, so there's really a very limited role um, um, uh, for the future deployment and for organizational barriers, what I would say indeed, I mean, policy making makers um, realize that there are uh, use, land use and resource constraints, that there are sustainability constraints. So it basically uh, puts a clear cap in terms of available funding. Uh, and since the projects are more expensive, they don't materialize on the market without regulation. Thank you so much. And uh, the next question is also a continuation of the biomass issue. And it goes to uh, Alina Sviderska. So uh, the question is about perspectives of international cooperation of Ukraine with European Union in the field of biomass energy. 
So what key institutional mechanisms on the national and local level should be activated in order to achieve efficient cooperation? Well, actually, the answer could relate not only to biomass, but in general to all green energy sources. So in order to activate it or to actually have it, the government must comply with its current obligations. So the government must uh, pay the green tariff, which uh, the companies actually sign up for when they are entering the country. The government must pay this feed-in tariff, uh, not uh, have the accumulation of the debt like since uh, March this year. Uh, so, I mean, in order for any uh, like green deal being realized in Ukraine, there is a need for the stabilization of the situation and the government must ensure the bankability of the sector, which is not right now. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that all green energy market is mostly on hold right now. Probably the projects which already started, there will be finished, hopefully. Um, but the rest uh, is, is just a question of where there, whether there will be even financing for this project, because I know that most of the lenders are also on hold. Uh, those who are not on hold, they are increasing their um, uh, percentage. Uh, and speaking about the biomass, Christian already mentioned that these projects are quite expensive. Uh, so this is another reason why it's uh, more difficult to make it in Ukraine, even though it makes total sense because Ukraine is quite an agricultural country and there is lots of supply uh, for the biomass uh, projects. But uh, for the reasons of regulatory instability and in general the expensiveness of projects, it, it might be on hold for, for, for several years. Thank you, Alina. Yep, it, uh, it is very important to understand for all of us uh, that regulation conditions and uh, investment climate uh, can influence a lot future development of the sector. And we have uh, one more question. Um, it is about the Germany uh, case uh, for PV, so I would address it to Christian. Um, according to report from Fraunhofer uh, Gesellschaft, currently the average feed price for solar in Germany is uh, 25 euro cent. Is this uh, the result of rapid market growth at the start of the market? Okay, thanks very much for the question. I would be very interested uh, if you could maybe send me uh, that report because I'm not fully aware of it. Uh, I also suspect maybe there is a little um, um, thing with the uh, the, uh, the amount stated because 25 cent per kilowatt hour it would be very expensive uh, where we have seen in the recent auctions remuneration levels about four cents per kilowatt hour uh, so maybe it's um, uh, 2.5 cent Per kilowatt hour and that I would explain it then that this is let's say the uh, the sliding premium because the PV generators uh, or, or project developers they enter uh, the auction with a total remuneration they would need that their project uh, uh, becomes cost competitive and this then is split up in some earnings from the power market and the dedicated sliding premium to meet, let's say, the gap between the power market price on the wholesale market and the total required remuneration. And if you have, you maybe have four cents per kilowatt hour required total remuneration and you earn 1.5 cents uh, on the market, then you get 2.5 cents as premium payment. So maybe th this is the, uh, yeah, thanks for the link. I, I will check it out and, and could come back to you via email. But this is my expectation, what this 2.5 cents would be about. And just to maybe, if you allow me one, one last remark, Germany with respect to PV is of course not the cheapest market uh, in the European Union because Germany is not known too much for being an extremely sunny country. Uh, so we have just recently seen a tender for PV in Portugal, which cleared a total remuneration at 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's, I think, now the record in Europe, but also globally, 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour for uh, PV. I don't know for how many years. I also expect maybe some, some 20 years as a remuneration period. 
But thanks for the link on the Fraunhofer report. I will check that out. Thank you, Christian. Yes, yeah, this is uh, inspiring data on uh, auctioning results uh, in Portugal. Ukraine is not such a sunny country as Portugal or Spain, but still we uh, can work in this direction that in Ukraine sometime auction at least will start and we will at least know what would be the results of the first auctions in Ukraine to compare with uh, uh, the figures we have from the European Union. Um, at the moment, we do not have uh, any raised hands uh, or questions in chat. Uh, we have one more question, and they suppose that this will be the last one, as our expected time for today's event is, uh, is one hour. So with this uh, question, I would like to um, close the question and answer session. Uh, the question is, uh, do renewable participate in balancing of power system? If yes, uh, what uh, are those mechanisms? And I, uh, again, uh, can guess that this is about the Germany uh, case and uh, address this question to Christian. Sorry, can you very quickly repeat? The question. Do renewables participate in balancing of the power ah, yes. system? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. F thanks very much for the question. Yes, very important. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, with the switch to Fidium premium system uh, in 2014, renewables became balancing uh, responsible. Um, so they, on the one hand, have to pay for any imbalances they cause, but they can also, in reverse, actively participate in the balancing market. And they do offer that, especially onshore wind, uh, but typically only in one direction, uh, meaning that they uh, voluntarily curtail the production in times when there is too much supply compared to demand uh, and so they, that's the I think the so-called negative balancing energy market so they offer services uh, uh, for lowering um, generation close to real time if the TSO uh, needs that to balance the system so their renewables are very active but it also indeed took some time to adapt the market design for that balancing markets that the renewables could become active players in that. And that's also very important. I think um, uh, the more renewables we have in the system, the more responsibility they should have for security of supply. And it's also an income opportunity. So uh, um, quite, quite some dynamics there. And if you allow me, I just quickly had a look on this report from Fraunhofer indeed. I understand now why, because it focuses also on small scale PV, which is not participating in auctioning. And there we still have the old fit uh, structure. And then the main thing is to compare, let's say the feed-in tariff uh, with the uh, household electricity price. And then a fit of 25 cent per kilowatt hour is still lower than the household electricity price of 30 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's um, PV is also cheaper for the final household consumer than the electricity from the grid. Um, uh, but fewer and fewer people are using that feed-in tariff scheme for small scale PV because um, if you save 30 cents on your electricity bill, but you would only get 25 cents from the TSO to sell the PV, you would prefer to consume it on your own. So the self-consumption is the main driver now for household electricity, uh, for household PV installation, sorry, compared to the feed-in tariff. Thank you. This is uh, very, very important. And the one, the very last question is, uh, uh, about uh, can renewables get some payments or fund compensation from market in case of curtailment? Uh, but this is what mostly what you were saying about like kind of a negative uh, balancing. So you can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Many thanks for the question, yes. Uh, so this is, I think, still somewhat different from the negative balancing energy where the renewables uh, actively offer to curtail um, and that's mainly then an issue of the TSO looking at the system balance. So how much in every second is consumed and produced and there has to be an equilibrium, of course. Uh, the curtailment, there is also the curtailment foreseen for renewables, especially uh, mainly onshore wind in the north of Germany. 
And this is not because of the energy balance, but this is because of constraints in the transmission grid from the north to the south of Germany, because the consumption centers are to a large extent in the south of Germany, but a lot of wind obviously is in the north, closer to the sea, and there it's windier, uh, but there's not enough grid capacity to transport all the wind from north to south, because Germany, uh, it's still one market, one price zone on the wholesale market, uh, uh, but the grid infrastructure does not, let's say, cope with this big market. Uh, and for that, there is an option in the renewable support law that the TSOs can curtail uh, wind in the north if uh, the grid cannot transport it to the south, but then the renewables operator gets a compensation equivalent either to depending which system the operator of the plant is still in, whether it's the old fit system or the new fit in premium system, there is a remuneration of, I think, 90% of the original amount foreseen for curtailed energy. And that's also important, of course, for the investor risk perspective, uh, because it's not the fault of the investor that there's necessar not necessarily enough grid capacity available. Thank you, Christian. This is very important to understand. Uh, the discussion can continue and continue and we have uh, more questions on curtailment, for example, and compensation. Um, so let's decide what we are doing. Uh, rather to close this question and this discussion, I would allow this the very last question in prolonging the discussion about, so uh, those renewables what are contained, they get compensation only for uncertain energy or for the time that they are offline or work with lower load, whether renewables provide auxiliary services. Yeah, thank you. So yes, they do provide auxiliary service in the t mainly in the context of uh, negative balancing energy. Uh, so they are active market participants in this type of markets, which is an organized market by the TSOs in Germany. And for the compensation, for the curtailment for grid, um, uh, so the renewables are balancing um, uh, responsible. So the day before they submit a detailed schedule for every 15 minutes of the entire next day to the TSO, what they are scheduled uh, or forecasted generation is, what they plan to uh, uh, feed into the grid essentially. Now then the TSO checks that or the TSOs, we have a four in Germany, the TSOs do an integrated and joint grid planning and to see whether all the schedules from all supply and demand throughout Germany is feasible with the grid and if some uh, renewables curtailment has to be curtailed to keep the system in balance then those uh, uh, curtailed energy gets the compensation that's then the difference between the curtailment instruction you get from the TSO and your schedule you submit it to the very same TSO, let's say at noon uh, uh, of, 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 of the day before delivery and some hours later you get informed, yes, but sorry for the next day from 11, 11 to 11.15 11 you cannot generate 100 megawatt as you planned but only 17, 70 and for that 30 you get then the uh, 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 compensation and the rest you sell on the market. Uh, thank you so much, uh, both from the author of the question and from me personally and from all of the participants. It was very uh, fruitful to listen to the presentation and thank you both Christian and Delina for your valuable inputs. Uh, the discussion around the support schemes for renewables is very hot and up to date in Ukraine now, so we still uh, hope to see um, higher uh, interest to this topic in the nearest time. But with all of you who were with us today, we are going to stay in touch. At least we will share the recording of today's event and the presentation of Christian with you. So please stay in touch with us. Uh, we hope that it was an uh, effective uh, event and you spend your time productively with us. Uh, keep, look, uh, keep forward to meet you at future events. So thank you, colleagues, and see you next time.